Man, I uh, also just want to give a shout out to you and thank you for your generosity this morning. You guys brought 69 bags by the bumper in this service. So bravo, that brought our number up to 200, over 200 today. So thank you for your generosity. Those bags go to feed my people, to help people who are in a difficult season of life. We want to be all about that. We, Jesus tells us to remember the poor, so we want to do that. A lot of us have been there in those difficult seasons of life, and God has helped us through. So thank you for your generosity. Speaking of that, I want to echo what James and Rebecca just said about money life. One of the ways that you can get involved in giving and get on the right track, get on the track of generosity is money life. So it's a class that about a thousand people plus have gone through over the last several years, and it will help you to, to get on track. So I want to say that uh, what, how, this, how this church operates is not just a, you know, four or five benefactors who are rolling in the cash and they give and, and then the rest of us, uh, we don't have to do anything. No, it takes, takes everybody. So I want to thank you for your generosity. I invite you, if you haven't started giving, if this is your church and you, you say, this is my home for now, then get in and help us. Let's, let's be responsible. Let's, let's be generous and see God's work go around the world. Yeah. So we're going to be starting in Genesis and we're going to go to Revelation. Not today. So just relax, but we're going to get started. We'd love for you to get your copy of God's Word, turn there, and uh, let's get going. So yesterday, I officiated in a wedding. It was a joy. It was a lot of fun. Isaac and Char Parks. And I was thinking as I was uh, doing the wedding and even in our premarital counseling, I was sitting together with them and trying to prepare them for things to come and realizing how much when I got married, how much I didn't know. Just things that you figure out along the way that you don't know. So one of the things that I learned pretty quickly is that not every conversation is a, a problem to be solved. Duh. It's like, you know, I, my wife would come back from the store and she'd say, the weirdest thing happened, you know, I was standing in line, and this guy behind me just starts going off on me about how many items I had, and he was in a hurry, and I was like, I'm sorry, you know, if you would have got here first, you could be going, but I'm here, and and I'm like, what's his name? What's his number? I'm going to go find the man. And she's like, no, no, I'm just telling you. We're just talking here. And I started realizing over time, not the point of every conversation is not something to fix. All the men said amen. <laughs> yeah, It's like you're supposed to find out what is the point. So over time, I've just learned to say, okay, just tell me, are we just chatting right now? <laughs> Or, or am I going to have to fix something? And she'll say, no, we're just chatting. So then I just relax and eat my fried potatoes, you know. But sometimes in a conversation or in life or a book or an article or whatever you happen to be engaged in, you ask that at some point. What is the point? What's the point of this conversation? You're asking that right now. What is the point of this message? I'm going to get there. What's, what's the, especially in a movie, if, you're, if you get in like halfway, you're not going to get the whole story. You're going to miss the point. So I'm a, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Don't judge me. I, you know, I'm just into it. I read the books, and then, then when the trilogy came out, I was into it. And so I was, I was telling my friends, man, I'm excited. I'm getting into this. And, you know, several months later, one of my friends said, you know, I, I went to see Lord of the Rings. I, I, I went to number two, the, the middle of the series. And I, and I, I go, oh, man. I, so how was it? He said, I just, I couldn't follow it. I was like, what are the hobbits and the dwarfs and the guy with the long beard and what's the whole ring thing? I left in 30 minutes. I'm like, dude, you're, you're, you're missing the whole thing because you, you got to start at the beginning to get to the main point. Now, this isn't an ad for Lord of the Rings, but it's, it's, a, it's a point that in life and in God's story, we need to figure out what is God doing? 
What, what, is, what is the point? That's the, that's the heart behind this series that we're in. We're going to take six weeks, and I'm, I'm just trusting that you guys, it's like we're beginning a semester. You're going to be in this with me, and we're going to learn together, and we're going to step back from the Bible and try to see what is the overarching theme? What is it that God is trying to say? What is he doing with mankind? Some people maybe are here today, and you look at the Bible, and you think it's a rule book. I look at the Old Testament, it says, don't murder, don't steal. And then I go to the Proverbs, and it tells about wisdom for young men, and get to the New Testament, other things that God's telling me to do. And I I kind of approach the Bible as a manual for life, trying to figure out what is it that God wants, who does he want me to marry, what kind of, and if you do that, you're going to miss the point. Those things are hinted at, but that's not the main point of the Bible. Maybe you're not a Christian and you've been to a ball game and you see John 3.16 in the end zone, somebody with a placard, and you think, I wonder what that is. And you look it up and it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. And you're thinking, who's the son? Who's perishing? I don't feel like I'm perishing. Who needs ever? And so you get confused and you will be unless you kind of walk through over time what is, God, what is it that God is doing in the earth? And we could say that the whole point of the Bible is mainly God loves people and Jesus is the hero. Well, yeah, that's true, but you're going to miss a lot of the heart of the story. So we've got to go back to the beginning to learn the point. So I, I want to say right from the get-go, there is nothing, and I believe, nothing more important than you understanding the big idea, the main point. In fact, I don't think you will understand life. I don't think you will get who you are and who God is. I don't think you'll get a real sense of purpose for your life. I don't think you'll understand the world when you look at things like the Georgia high school shooting and you say, where is God? I don't think you'll... Any of that will come together unless we go back to the beginning. So we're going to go back to Genesis, which begins with four words. In the beginning, God. In the ancient Hebrew language, and I'm not an expert on this, but it basically sounded something like, Bereshit bara Elohim. That first word is the word we get Genesis from. It means Genesis. It means beginning. In the beginning. Bear a seat. In the beginning, God. That's where it starts. And if you don't agree with that, the rest of the Bible is going to be confusing. Now, I'm not here to twist your arm to make you believe that. But this is how it begins. In the beginning, God, the all-sufficient being, who was not lonely, by the way, Father, Son, and Spirit, he was completely joyful, fulfilled, but out of love and out of joy, he created all that is. He created the worlds, and he made Adam and Eve to be in relationship with him. It says in verse 27 of chapter 1, so God created man in his own image. So God somehow, somehow in us is the imprint, the fingerprint of God. It says God was here. Every person bears some part of the image of Of God. So God created Adam and Eve, created all that is. And in verse 31, we read that God stood back and he rested and he said, That's very good. So in the beginning, everything was very good. I want you to understand that, get that in your heart. There were no tears, there were no diseases, there was no cancer. There were no chiggers. Can I get a witness? I don't even think there was 97% humidity. I think it was comfortable. 
And God said it was very good. And not only that, God gave Adam significance in that he gave him a job. This was before the fall, by the way. Work is not a curse. God gave Adam a job, and most of all, he gave him companionship and significance. How did he do that? In this emotionally connected friendship that he had with Adam and Eve. Can you imagine walking and talking with God every day, real life? Like God coming to Adam and saying, what would you do today, man? Well, you know, God, I was over there and I planted this row of hedges. And God comes over and says, I like that, man, good job. And he says, Eve, she was over there by the waterfall and she was planting flowers. And then God walks over there, wow. Sweet, I like that. Can you imagine the significance that that would give you? Man, I love it when somebody important remember, just remembers my name. They remember me. They know my name. Or they like something that I said and give me a thumbs up. And I was like, man, you know, thank you for that. Imagine if God was saying that. Imagine the significance of a God, a great God, this incredible maker and creator would would talk with you every day. But this relationship that God offered to Adam and Eve had terms to it. It was a covenant, this word we're going to unpack over the next several weeks. It was a relationship that had terms and conditions. Even now, today, even though we don't understand this word a lot, it basically means the same thing, a relational agreement between two parties with terms and conditions. We still have that today, by the way. We have terms and conditions on relationships. God's terms on this relationship was this. I'm going to bless you. In fact, he says, um, I, think it's, I think it's in the first chapter, it says that I, I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. I give you the whole garden. You may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So two options. God is giving them an offer of be blessed, multiply. Here's your domain. Here's your job. You are co-regents with me. We're going to partnership and do this together. But you don't trust me, there is another way. There's a tree here. It's forbidden fruit. And some of us right there, we go, wait a minute, that doesn't seem fair. Why would God put something that could harm them right there? It's a decent question. But what God is wanting, he's wanting voluntary love. And as long as you don't have an option, it's not voluntary. God wanted people who would love him back because they wanted to, because they wanted to trust him. Rather than, he could have just made robots. And then on Sundays and Wednesdays, we would all march in to our seat. We would raise our hands. I love you, Lord. I worship you. On Wednesdays, I love you, Lord. I worship you. And then we'd all go home. That's not love. So God says, I'm going to give you the option of trusting me, loving me, and these are the terms. Just like in real life, I mean, there are some things we just understand you don't do. And it's like, you don't have to ask. You just figure it out over time. Like, you don't ask your mother-in-law how much does she weigh. You don't do that. I'm just telling you right now, dog, don't do that. You don't beat your older brother at golf. You let him win because I'm the older brother. (laughs) You don't tell your boss in front of the whole team, you've got bad breath. Man, that could set off a smoke alarm. (laughs) You you just don't do that. You pull him aside, breath man. It's just like terms and conditions. We need some terms and conditions. And it's the same way in dating. If you're dating, the girl's going to say at some point, hey, I just want to know, what is this? What are the terms? Am I just one of your flings? Or is is there something 
You're trying to establish the boundaries and the terms. So God does this. Everything is great. He's blessed them, offers them everything. But he does give them an option. And there is this tree. It wasn't a trick. It wasn't an apple. We don't know what it was. It wasn't like God said, I've got something really against Apples, I want you to eat pears and peaches. It wasn't like that. It, it, God was just saying, this is another way to live. But you can live my way and you can trust me. So here comes the serpent. Now, we don't, the, the writer doesn't tell us if this was Satan personified as a serpent. We do, we're kind of missing some of the details. We don't know if some of this is symbolism. But we do know that God is showing us that there was an enemy that was speaking at this time that gave Eve another option. And it wasn't primarily that the serpent is going Nanny, nanny, boo-boo, you know you want this. As much as it was, Satan, whose enemy was God, not Adam and Eve. What Satan knew is, this is how I can get at God. I'll go after what he loves. Because Satan was no match for God on his turf. But he could get at his co-regents. So he goes after Eve and he asks that famous question. It's not a statement. It's just a suggestion. It just begins with the thought. Did God actually say? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Do you hear the proposal? In other words, are you sure you can trust God? Trust me, is what he's saying. Don't trust God. And he takes God's words and actually twists them because God did not say, don't eat of any tree. And she corrects him and says, no, actually, we can eat of every tree except that one. And when we eat it, we will die. And then Satan comes out with just a blatant untruth. You won't die. God's just jealous of you. He knows when you eat it, you're going to be like him. So you can't trust him. And so she takes, she eats, she gives it to her husband, and then you know the story, even if you're not a Christian, you know most of this, that when they ate, their eyes were opened, and they knew their shame, and they sewed fig leaves to try to cover themselves, and God comes as he often has. In the cool of the day, and ask to me, I think, one of the saddest questions in the Bible. Where are you, Adam? Where are you? And God's voice echoes in the garden. Where are you? Nothing. And then a little rustle behind the shrubs. Adam, little hand comes up. Over here. What are you doing there? Why are you hiding? Well, we ate the fruit and now we're experiencing shame and we kind of figured some things out that we didn't know before. And, and then the consequences come. And I just have to believe here that God is aching, grieving, weeping, because of what could have been has now been broken. And the terms of the covenant, the consequences are now set in motion so that God, because of their disobedience, he says, well, then you've got to go your way because this is my way. And they are cast out of the garden. It says on the east of Eden in verse 23, to work the ground from which he was taken. Paradise lost. Cursed ground, cursed relationship. What was intimate now becomes isolation. What was near now becomes distant. Now they are deaf to the voice of God, and now instead of friendship, they have a strangeness between them and God. This, my friend, is what is wrong with the world. Right here. Because... Where are you, Adam, 
has turned into, where are you, God? That's what we're asking. That in the difficulties of life, when, so, when a child gets cancer, where are you, God? When in a Georgia high school, a 14-year-old takes lives, where are you, God? When the leading, second leading cause of death between the ages of 10 and 25 is suicide. That's today. Oh, we're, the world is getting better. Humans are getting smarter. We're becoming so much more intelligent. We are. Why, are, why is this generation taking their own life? And the nation, and we who stand back, who don't know the whole story, that's where we're tempted to go. Where is God? He's right where we left him. When we said, we don't, we don't trust you, we don't want you, but we want you to save the day sometimes, but the rest of the time, can you just stay out of our life? And God says, no, I want a covenant. I want a relationship with you. I want this to be long term but there are terms and conditions. I want a covenant relationship. Yesterday, as I said, I officiated in this wedding, Isaac and Char Parks, beautiful couple, 20 years old, guys, 20, 20. And I know some of you old timers are saying, boy, they don't know what they're getting into. Of course they don't. That's why they got married. They don't know any better. <laughs> but you can see the joy in their faces of approaching life. Life is going to be awesome. We're, it's just going to be joy, joy. We're going to be in love the rest of our life. And I hope they are. But I tried to prepare them in marriage counseling by saying, tests are going to come. You're not going to always think he is the bomb. You're not going to always think she is awesome. But don't freak out. It happens. Just hang on. Tests will come, but hang on. But there are some times when people, because we live in a broken world, we lose our sense of direction, and one of the saddest things that I have to face as a pastor is watching people who break their covenant and walk away and leave in the wake of the crash debris, Broken hearts, broken promises, broken vows, broken family. And it's because of a broken covenant. And you know, God throughout the Bible relates to us as his bride. And that when we walk away from him, to him it's like adultery. It's like a divorce. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the picture is a beautiful wedding where God reconciles us completely back to him. So in the Bible, what we're seeing is this broken, lost paradise, and God's saying, now how am I going to fix this? What am I going to do? God always has a plan. He sees the end from the beginning. So God, right in the Garden of Eden in chapter 3, prophesies and says, Here's what's going to happen. Yes, there are consequences, but here's the truth. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. You wonder why you don't like snakes? There it is, my friend. Between your offspring and her offspring, in other words, between your children and Satan's children, those who follow the way of Satan, now here's what's going to happen. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Fast forward, Isaiah, 800 years before the time of Christ, looks through the lens of prophecy and sees the offspring of Eve, Jesus Christ, and says, but he was wounded for our transgression, and he was bruised for our iniquity. There it is. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Jesus Christ was bruised 
so that paradise could be regained. So that on the cross, when Jesus is nailed to the cross and a thief to his side speaks to him and says, would you remember me when, you're king, and when you come into your kingdom? He believes that Jesus is who he says he is. And Jesus says those famous words, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus makes the way back to paradise through the cross and the resurrection and accomplishes exactly what he said he would do in Genesis 3 and 15. I tell you, God is a promise keeper. He is a promise keeper. Oh, man, this fires me up, if nobody else. I just think, wow, how God designs this way forward that even when we do our worst, when Satan does his worst, God is still one move ahead of him and accomplishes his plan. That thousands of years later that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? To crush the head of the serpent. I recently discovered something that's called kintsugi. It's a Japanese art. And the story goes that there was a, a man in China that had a broken vessel that was very expensive. And he still wanted it to be put back together. And so they did. They just kind of glued it back together and put staples. And he said, no, that, that doesn't look right. So... They sent it to Japan, and these artists began to put things back together using gold so that every line in the finished product represents a place where something was broken and is now fused back together. The end product was more valuable than it was in the beginning. And I say that to say this, that there are some of us, when we look at the Bible, say, oh, it could have been so awesome if Adam and Eve just wouldn't have done that. I get it. I understand that. And some of us look at our lives and we say, man, I've made a mess. I've broken so many promises. I've broken so many vows. I've fallen short so many times, so many promises. I said I'd never drink alcohol again, and then I did it, and I lost my family. And you just look at life or maybe a marriage and say, this is broken beyond repair. I want to tell you that because of Jesus Christ, there is nothing impossible to God. And that God, here's the amazing thing, that God can actually put it back together and it becomes part of the story where God can say, actually the end product is more valuable than it was in the beginning because the glory goes to God to say, look what I did with brokenness. So we look at, we look at what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Can I give you a little nugget again, just a little Greek language here? So in the original language this was written to, this word right here is poema. So it's like God is saying, you are my well-crafted poem. You are my vessel that I take up the broken pieces, and it's not gold, it's actually the blood of my son that makes it possible that you can be restored and redeemed. And in the end, the glory goes to God, not to you. Look what I did, how I got my life together. No, you didn't, dog. You didn't do that. God did it, if you're honest. How are you still sitting here today? You've been what you've been through? Glory to God. I am his masterpiece. Well, you say, I've... I don't know, man. I, I've just I've messed up so many times in my life. I just don't know. I don't know if I can come back. Hear the words of Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that, what's the word, next word? Whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not stay broken 
and you have everlasting life. I love that word, whosoever. Any whosoever's? I love that word, whosoever. Because, you know, sometimes my wife makes something, bakes something in the kitchen, like, you know, that famous chocolate cake I've told you guys about? And I'll be sitting on the counter, and I come in, and I, the smart question to ask is, who's that for? Before I cut it and dive in. Sometimes she says, well, you know, that's for a shower I'm going to, or that's for somebody that's sick. But every now and then she goes, oh, whoever. <laughs> hey, I'm a whoever. <laughs> that's me. And this is what God says. Whosoever will. Believe in him. Trust him. Oh, you can trust the serpent if you want. You can trust yourself. Look inside. What, what does my heart say? Mm. You can do that, or you can trust the God who said, I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. I want a relationship with you. I want to talk with you. I want to give your life significance. We're going to go through stuff together. You're going to go through trials and tests but I'm going to be with you. It's a broken world. It's a hard world. Stuff happens. It wasn't in my heart. It wasn't my first plan, but I'm going to be with you. We're going to get through this together. You can trust that voice, the one who died for you. He's legit. He really loves you. Before the foundations of the world, this is what's amazing to me, before God ever carved the mountains and the valleys, before he ever flung out Saturn with its beautiful rings and Jupiter with all of its moons. He saw you. Think about that. He knows your name. Scripture tells us from the foundation of the world, from Genesis chapter 3, God saw you. Now, if you don't think you matter, you need to hear that again. He saw you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you. But you have to trust him. That's the terms. Trust him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you haven't done that, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, you guys bow with me. Let's pause a moment. Most important decision you'll ever make is to say, Jesus, be my Lord. Father, be my God. And you can call out to him right now. Quiet of this moment. Even if you're watching online, say, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. I have doubts, but I'm going to trust you. I, the best way I know how. Come into my life. I believe you are Lord and Savior. Be my master, be my God, in Jesus' name.